Shut up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now you got her PhD from Princeton. Uh, following that, she, she moved all the way to the IIS, <laughs> uh, where she's been ever since. Uh, today she'll tell us about the search for skewered quasars. Okay. Thank you. So um, this is really carrying around my tail. Um, okay. I want to start by thanking my collaborators. Uh, Michael Strauss and Julian Krolik were advising me when I was a graduate student over the, at the university. Um, Raina Reyes and Laura Gomez were graduate students working with me, and I'm especially excited because Raina just finished her paper that I'm going to describe later on in the talk, and we had a press release, and she got some AAS prize for a poster or something, so she's done really well. I'm very happy about that paper. So, um, and then uh, some other collaborators, not all of whom are actually listed here, even. Okay, so I'll start by telling you what obscure type two, type two, or type two quasars are, and I'm going to use this term interchangeably, and um, I'm going to tell you why we think they're interesting and um, nice to look for and study. Um, then I'm going to tell you about our work to look for type two quasars in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data, and then about the multi-wavelength follow-up that we've done to study these objects, and then sort of to put that into the bro broader perspective to tell you about other searches for obscurity EGN and at, in surveys at various wavelengths. Okay, so what are they? And you have probably seen this cartoon many times before. This is from an AGN unification model review paper by Uri and Padovani. So the idea is that the black hole's in the center, then there is stuff around it, um, <clears throat> accretion disk, broadline region, so that emits in soft X-rays, ultraviolet in the optical. And then um, there's, some, there's some kind of circumstellar material around the stuff. Uh, well, here it's, it's shown as sort of bagel shapes, but it's not necessarily that regular. In any case, if you're looking down the throat of this, this object, you can see all of the X-rays, UV optical emission, the broadline region. But if you're looking from the side, you can't see any of that. The only sign possible signature of the AGN that you would be able to see is this material illuminated by the AGN. And so uh, that produces uh, strong narrow lines in the optical, um, among other things. So this model was developed for low luminosity objects, the so-called secret galaxies, which have been known for several decades in our neighborhood. And up until very recently, it was not clear whether the same picture could be applied to very luminous ordinary quasars, say, for example, things that you find at redshift of a couple during the quasar epoch or something. So, um, like I said, UV soft and uh, soft X-rays would be very anisotropic in this picture. In the optical, in the best case, you would only see narrow emission lines. And then the radio emission may or may not be present, so um, I'm not going to talk about that much more. So there's all this famous question of um, uh, why certain AGN become radio loud and others don't. But this is not part of, uh, this is not going to be part of this talk. Okay, so a little bit of history. I think um, up until re recently, there were only a few objects known. Um, so narrow-line radio galaxies actually have been known since 1960s. And in, in the review paper uh, in 1993, McCarty sa said that in order to power the observed narrow-line emission, you have to have a very powerful source in the, in the center. And he estimated luminosities of 10 to 46, 10 to 47 arc per second. So this is an example of one of the objects. Uh, this is just taken in the a picture taken in the narrow line filter centered on the O3 emission line. And so this, the extent of this emission is about 15 kiloparsecs. And so you can calculate how much uh, radiation here in the center you need to power this very extended source. In the infrared, um, a few objects were selected. Uh, based on their very high infrared to optical ratios, it was postulated at some point that maybe the ultraluminous infrared galaxies were obscured quasars. But now, pretty much people think that most of the radiation there is powered by the starburst component rather than by the AGN. There is one very luminous type to quasar selected uh, based on the high infrared to optical uh, ratio in IRAS 09104, famous source. Then. Um, you can try to select them by red near infrared colors, but this uh, criterion selects sor sources that have the sort of 
column not very high column density, so you have optical extinction of maybe several magnitudes, whereas in truly obscured quasars, we're really talking about tens and hundreds of optical extinction, tens and hundreds of magnitudes of optical extinction. And then in deep X-ray surveys, there were a few objects selected at uh, re relatively high redshifts. Those sources all have to be confirmed by optical spectroscopy. So this is one of the uh, one of the examples of this. So this is the rest frame UV spectrum, and you can see strong narrow emission lines, practically no continuum, and it's a pretty powerful X-ray source. So these days, the situation has changed. These objects are now routinely found in X-ray, optical, infrared, and multi-wavelength surveys. There are many dozen of type 2 quasars known. And so the question has gone from trying to find these objects on an individual basis, you know, five years ago or something, to trying to measure their contribution to uh, source counts at every wavelength to try to measure how many of them there are. And so, and I'm going to come back to this point a little bit later on. Um, basically, I think that there's a little bit of a controversy in this field right now, although it, both of these statements have pretty strong, pretty significant error bars on them at this point. But uh, people who are working on the contents of X-ray surveys have been saying for years now that the obscured to unobscured ratio strongly declines with the luminosity, whereas the infrared survey, surveys, um, especially Spitzer surveys, seem to indicate that type 2 to type 1 ratio is, is not decli significantly declining with luminosity, and it's greater than 1, even at the highest luminosity. So you can think of that, you know, for every optically luminous op quasar, um, blue normal broadline quasar, there's got to be at least one obscured quasar that hasn't been seen. Okay, why do we care about these objects? Well, um, structure of AGN itself is an interesting topic. And so, uh, for example, uh, one possible question is, well, does the, the same geometric unification model apply to quasars, that is, objects at very high luminosities, or is there any dependence of the structure, um, and in particular, the covering fraction of this material on the luminosity? Another question which is really fashionable these days is um, the connection between the AGN activity and the formation of the host galaxy. And this, of course, was prompted by the discovery of the very strong correlation between the black hole mass and the velocity dispersion of the bulge in the galaxies. And so the two components are on very different physical scales. And so there's got to be some connection between the formation of this tiny black hole and formation of the bulge. Um, bulge of the galaxy, and so um, there. I'm not going to go into detail um, here, but there's a lot of um, activity in this field right now, and so obscurity GN are, for example, part of merger-driven models of um, joint joint AGN galaxy formation, and so um, yet other people are interested in the senses of supermassive black holes, uh, for example, trying to understand what goes into the hard X-ray background. Uh, but also, um, this is an interesting question, how to estimate the accretion efficiency of the black hole. So, um, you know, you observe light from quasars. You also know that in the local universe there are relic black holes. So the two are connected via the, basically, efficiency of accretion onto a black hole. So you can count up all the light, you, light of the quasars. You can count up all the mass in the relic black holes and find the accretion efficiency and obscured AGN do make a contribution to this calculation. Okay, the, oh, the, this picture is from the uh, papers by Hopkins et al. So those are the merger-driven uh, models of joint um, galaxy AG information. So they start with very rich, gas-rich galaxies. Uh, they merge them. They have some prescription for feedback. Um, so AGN outputs uh, some amount of energy. Some fraction of that energy gets coupled to the gas. And then they basically try to follow um, they have prescriptions for every step of that process, of course, and they try to follow the uh, formation of the galaxy and the, uh, the uh, what would be the apparent luminosity of the AGN. So, and this uh, and this is just the spectrum of the X-ray background, and basically one of the models that reproduces that, uh, which requires a lot of obscured AGN. 
Okay, so um, now I'm going to go to how we found type 2 quasars in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey data. I'm going to start with just a quick overview of the survey. So Sloan Digital Sky Survey uses a dedicated 2.5 meter telescope at the Apache Point Observatory. They do five band imaging and then follow up multi-fiber spectroscopy. So the way it works, there's a, they take data in five bands and then there's an automated pipeline that basically selects objects for follow-up spectroscopy based on some predefined criteria. And this turns out important for us um, later on. So the original goal was to cover 10,000 square degrees, which is basically a quarter of the sky. Yet spectra of million galaxies and 10 to the 5 quasars. Uh, well, currently public is roughly that number. Um, and the spectroscopic target selection, which I mentioned before, is based on some photometric properties like extended morphology, colors, maybe they want to follow up some faint radio sources, um, they want to follow up blue sources because, because many of those are quasars, they want to follow up red sources because uh, many of those are luminous, luminous red galaxies, and they have some serendipity program, uh, which is basically after all of these main programs are executed and if they have any fibers left on the plate, they target objects uh, which have unusual colors, some unusual multi-wavelength property, radio emission or x-ray emission or something like that. So Sloan is now in phase two. Um, they're really not doing that much extragalactic science anymore. They're more focused on topics in uh, galactic structure and they're also doing a supernova survey. All right, so how did we do this? We basically searched the spectroscopic database for everything that looks like a CIFR2 galaxy, so a more luminous analog of a CIFR2 galaxy. We had to eventually restrict ourselves to redshift less than 0.8 because that's where this uh, strong emission line moves out of the spectrum and the objects just become very faint. We required that there would be no broad components and permitted and permitted emission lines, so that's because if there, there is a broad component, that means this object is not obscured enough for our liking. And then we required that there would be ionization lines or ionization line ratios, and, and that is to distinguish uh, narrow line AGN from, for example, star forming galaxies, which also have narrow lines. And then, um, and then we applied a luminosity cut to basically distinguish low luminosity AGN from high luminosity AGN. So we, uh, we first published a sample of 150 objects, and now we have about 900. All right, let me show you some spectra. So those are a bunch of emission line objects. This is a normal type 1 quasar. You can see a very blue continuum, uh, broad emission lines. Um, this is another normal unobscured quasar. Uh, the emission lines are somewhat narrower. Um, this is a so-called narrow line secret 1 galaxy, but this is still an unobscured source. This is a star-forming galaxy, so you can see the continuum from the galaxy, a bunch of narrow lines. This is O3, um, this is H beta. And you can see that O3 to H beta is, well, somewhat less than unity in this case. This is a CIFR2 galaxy, kind of low signal to noise. So this continuum here is dominated by the host galaxy, a bunch of absorption lines. This is O3, this is H beta. In this case, O3 to H beta is much higher. And so this is the basis for these standard diagnostic diagrams that are used in this business um, to distinguish star-forming galaxies from CIFR2 galaxies. Now these are our objects. Um, these are now an increasing redshift. So this is now O3 and H beta, O3 H beta, uh, very high ratio, practically no continuum because the galaxy is much fainter than, the, than these lines. Um, this little line here doesn't look like much, but it's a neon 5 line, which, which only is ever present in AGN because it's a ionization line. Okay, so we obtained this first sample, and so um, there was definitely some doubt whether or not we were doing the right thing. And so um, one of the first projects that we did was, to, uh, was the optical spectropolarimetry, and that historically was um, basically what allowed us to construct this unification model of AGN in the first place. So the idea is that even if we're looking along this line of sight, well, we don't see what's in the center, but this light gets scattered off material above and below the torus. And if we're looking at the polarized component, um, then we might be able to see sort of indirectly into the throat of the AGN. 
Okay, so we uh, use the spectropolarimeter on the uh, on MMT in in Arizona. We got the 12 luminous objects, so that those are published in this paper. But by now we have about a sample of 20 altogether. They're all highly polarized, um, up to roughly 20% in a couple of cases. Um, and so also there's some continuum from the host galaxy, so that's unpolarized because that's just produced by stars. So you need to subtract that out and um, to measure the true polarization of the light. In five objects, we detected broad lines in the scattered light. So I'm just going to show you a couple of really highly polarized objects. So here you're seeing this is the polarized flux, this is the polarized fraction, and this is the total optical spectrum. So that's what we had at first, and that's what we get when we look in polarized light. And you can see this, this here's the broad line. There was some funny atmospheric stuff here, so uh, there's a lot of noise in this. So this object is 20% polarized, which is pretty much unheard in this business. I mean, everything that's more than 3% polarized in the science is considered highly polarized. And I think we had the record for the highest um, obscured quasar polarization for a while uh, with 20%. That's right, yes. And uh, uh, basically the reason for that is that the, the continuum is practically a point source, so it illuminates your stuff and gets all scattered away, whereas the narrow, narrow lines are not, they're not obscured by the circumstellar material. They're emitted by an extended um, region sort of above and below this, uh, above and below the torus. So narrow lines are coming from here. I mean, that's just where they are produced. They're not polarized. Um, photons are coming from here. Photoionized gas, gas re recombines and emits, emits these emission lines. Whereas the scattered light component, um, photons come here, scatter off the materia material here, reach us. So the broad lines are going to be po polarized, and the continuum is going to be polarized, but the narrow lines are not. This, there is no correction here. In this particular object, uh, basically like all of the, I mean, this, this is set at zero here, but this is a non-zero detection of the continuum. And so if you just take the polarized flux, divide that by the total flux, that's what you get. In this object, there's no correction. This object is just 17% polarized everywhere except, except for these, uh, except for the narrow lines. So, and for the calculation of polarization, we exclude the narrow lines because we know that it's not supposed to be, I mean, and th that's what we see. It's not supposed to be polarized in them. That's a very good question. I wasn't going to go into that, but since you asked, uh, um, so um, historically, the, the one source on which the originally all of this was done, the source in Antonucci and Miller, 1985, was this NGC, famous NGC, Super 2 Galaxy. Um, 4268, NGC 4268. And there, it's pretty much clear that it's electron scattering because they see the same scattering regions in imaging in the optical, in the UV, and in the X-rays, it's completely wavelength independent. However, in many high redshift sources, they're doing polar, they have done polarimetry studies, and it seems that the scattering efficiency is wavelength dependent very strongly. So they postulated this is dust. For our sources, we cannot tell unambiguously. Uh, so both are possible, but we do have some indication that there may be some, um, there may be some wavelength dependence. For example, I was going to show this next object. For example, um, here in this object, again, you see the same thing. Um, this is polarized flux, polarized fraction, um, total continuum. So in this case, by the way, there is a host galaxy component, and it kicks in right around here, which is why the polarized fraction is going down, because there's contamination by the unpolarized uh, stellar light. But in this object, if you take the ratio of these two lines, H alpha and H beta, then it turns out that the, the ratio of H beta to H alpha is higher than in normal quasars. And so it turns out that the efficient, the um, it looks like the efficiency of scattering is rising to the to the UV. So um, 
So in this particular object, we have also other evidence that it might be dust scattering. We have some um, indication that it has forward scattering nature in this object, which electrons do not show. So it's a tricky question, and we, we tried. This is our best case. So for this case, we're pretty confident it's dust scattering and not electron scattering. OK. So we also did um, HST imaging of nine objects. Um, so we originally just wanted to study the morphologies and shapes of the host galaxies, but uh, we found all this interesting stuff with scattered light. So the, um, the most interesting thing here is, of course, that you can study very luminous quasars without contamination from this extremely bright source in the center. And so historically, it has been very hard to study host galaxies of quasars precisely because there's this quasar sitting in, right in the center outshining the, the whole galaxy. So we imaged nine objects in three bands with advanced camera for surveys, had another lovely proposal, and then you, know, you all know what happened. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and show you all these images. Um, OK, so these are the first six, and the last three are coming on the next slide. For each, for each uh, image, I show also a little cartoon. These uh, gray things are showing the brightest UV region that we observe. And this line here shows the um, polarization position angle that we measure from the MMT ground-based data. And so in most cases, their accurate, the orientation of the scattering region is accurately orthogonal to the or orientation of the polarization position angle. That's exactly what you expect if the polarization is due to scattering. OK, this is the object that you were just asking about uh, that I told you we, this is our best case for dust scattering. Um, so another thing to mention here is that the color stretch on all the images is the same. So if you see differences in colors of these galaxies, this is a real difference. So like this object is yellow. It's really yellow because the, it, it, it has a pretty strong um, Balmer break. So it's, it's a pretty young host galaxy. It's only about 10 to several times 10 to the 7, maybe 10 to the 8, actually, um, uh, years old. So Another thing I want to mention here is that you see that the, there's a variety of opening angles of, this scattered, of these scattering regions. These, um, so for example, here, I'm not sure you can see it very well, but there's a very narrow beam, you know, five degrees or something on the side. Here, on the contrary, you can see it's roughly 60 degrees, um, roughly 60 degrees here in projection as well. You can, yeah, that probably is. Um, so this is also telling you about the obscuration fraction because um, the um, opening angle of the scattering regions is basically just one minus the covering fraction of the obscuring material if you were sitting on the quasar and you were seeing this obscuring material. Um, another thing to notice here is that, for example, in this object, it's very symmetric. So this bagel picture that I showed in the beginning, well, it's not too far from truth in this particular case. In other cases, it's not so great because here, um, you know, they're not oriented exactly along the same line. But we are not really seeing something like, you know, a cloud with holes poked through it in random directions. We're really seeing some more symmetric structures. In this object, we are seeing the scattering region on the other side. It's just much fainter, and we think that this is because of the forward scattering um, dust grains. But we see this exactly symmetric feature on the other side. OK, then these are the last three objects. So we wanted to uh, call this a guitar galaxy, but unfortunately, there was already a guitar galaxy in the ARP catalog of interacting galaxies. And um, um, here's another object with extremely narrow um, scattering regions, also just a few degrees. Um, Norm, this is the disk, big disky galaxy I mentioned to you earlier today. OK, so these are just the conclusions from our HST imaging program. So we have a mix of ellipticals and disks. They're all more luminous than L-star galaxies at this redshift. We have some scattered light. We have some nuclear dust obscuration. Here in this object, you can see there's a dust lane going across the center a little bit, but it's not enough to produce the kinds of column densities we think they're there. 
Um, some medium age, uh, 10 to the 9 year old stellar populations. This object is an exception, it's much younger. So in other words, they're, they're very similar to hosts of type 1 quasars in, in term, nearby type 1 quasars for which um, some of these things have been uh, measured. And we have some more Gemini data to, to further study hosts. Okay, so I'm just going to march really quickly through some of the, oh, okay. Um, so yeah, the, so here's another project um, that is led by Jenny Green, uh, who is doing long slit spectroscopy with Magellan of type 2 quasars, also thinking that they're good targets precisely because there's not a big, fat quasar, optically bright quasar sitting in the center. Uh, she is interested in studying um, uh, quasar feedback, just trying to see that in action, all the stuff that, um, that is now being talked about in terms of coupling um, AGN activity to the formation of the galaxy. She, would, she is trying to um, see that observationally. And so we have a couple of dozen objects with Magellan uh, which are now being reduced. So I'm just showing a bunch of snapshot images and then this is, um, in, in all of these cases she has a long slit spectrum. So uh, in, this, in these guys it's, it's just not, the, the data are now being reduced. But here's a, one interesting case in which we put a slit along this direction and we saw a type 2 quasar in both of these objects which is pretty amazing. Here is an example of um, a pretty messy object. So we put a slit, I think, here, basically. And so we are seeing velocities in this O3 line, you know, up to several thousand kilometers per second. I mean, this is clearly a merging object, so unfortunately it's not such a clean target for quasar feedback. But um, we'll see what we can do with that. So this is, this is a very recent project that I've been involved in. Okay, um, so scattering optical depth, right, so that's right. So we have been, yeah, we, we try to estimate that basically assuming that we can, from our multi-wavelength observations, from the total intensity of the O3 line, we think we can estimate the intrinsic luminosity of this quasar. We can't see it, but we can estimate it. And then we compare that to what we have observationally. And we think that it's roughly 1% of the light from the quasar eventually, uh, eventually gets scattered. Yeah. So. Okay, um, so we did, um, we have been doing um, some multi-wavelength follow-up of these targets. In the x-rays, um, the first thing that we found out just by matching our catalog to the ROSET all-sky survey is that our targets are 10 times less likely to be ROSET sources than type 1 uh, quasars with the same redshift and O3 luminosity. And ROSET is a soft x-ray satellite, so it's only good until about 2.4 keV or something. So that's exactly what you expect if those sources have a large column density along the line of sight, which would absorb x-rays, um, which would be basically photoionizing material along the line of sight and would not reach you. So with Chandran XMM, we've been, we've been writing proposals every six months or so, and there is a competing group doing exactly the same thing with our targets. <laughs> So between us and them, we now have about 30, several years after. Um, so when, when these objects are detected in x-rays, they do show absorption. So these are a couple of good spectra in our case. And um, unfortunately, many are undetected. And so either these objects are x-ray weak or they are extremely absorbed, um, maybe even Compton thick. So the way we do this, we use, the, again, the O3 emission line to predict what the X-ray luminosity should be. Then we compare that with the X-ray upper limit, and then we try to estimate how much column density is required to bring the, the expected X-ray flux below our upper limit. So in, in some cases, we get, um, we get some pretty strong constraints on the column density. That's the competing group, by the way. OK. Um, this is a project that um, I think has a lot of future. Um, we've been trying to follow up some of our targets uh, in the infrared. We have a couple of programs with Spitzer. So I'm just going to start by showing you um, 
a, um, a Spitzer field of one of type 2 quasars. Here's the optical field. This is a GRI composite from Sloan. The type 2 quasar is this like thin blob in the center. This is the same field here with a Spitzer. And this is a composite of 3.6, 4.5, and 8.0. Um, and so all objects, all normal stars and normal galaxies appear blue in these colors because this is on the Rayleigh genes tail of the black body emission. And here's the, here's the type 2 quasar. So it's much redder than, um, than the normal black body spectrum. So we quickly confirmed that our objects are indeed very luminous, up to several times 10 to 46 arc per second, just in the infrared colors. And so um, the reason I'm quite excited about this project is that I personally think that Spitzer will find the best uh, most complete samples of obscured AGN. And so we're trying to develop purely photometric uh, methods to select type 2 quasars. So we are testing uh, existing methods and we are trying to play with um, selection of high redshift quasars. And this is very interesting because to this day, there are probably, I don't know, maybe 20 altogether objects in the literature, maybe 30, which are really high redshift type 2 quasars. So we really just have no idea about the population of obscured quasars at redshift of 2 or something. Um, here's another project, uh, Spitzer spectroscopy. Uh, this is a bunch of spectra, half of all the spectra that we have. We only have 12 sources. So if you ignore the top panel, just shows various templates, so that's not a real spectrum. These are the real spectra. So you can see that some are completely featureless. Some have a very strong silicate feature. Some have um, PAH emission, and some don't. Um, so we also detected uh, water ice and hydrocarbon absorption in this one object. We detected hydrogen rotation lines. But most of, uh, most of these data are going to be used for the purposes of trying to develop these photometric uh, criteria at high redshift. And we're also interested in probing um, physical models of AG and looking at radiative transfer models um, to explain these spectra, basically. Um, this is, a, this is uh, our data combined with uh, data on other sources, Seaford galaxies and ultraluminous infrared galaxies and quasars, which basically shows that the, co the colder your object is in the infrared colors, the stronger the depth of the silicate feature. And so I'm particularly interested in trying to explain this correlation on a quantitative level. Okay, so I'm just, um, I'm going to try to um, put all of this work in the context of what's going on at other wavelengths, because um, this is sort of a hot topic with people trying to find a um, complete sample of AGNs at every wavelength. So um, I'm going to do this by asking three questions and trying to, and trying to give my personal comments on these three questions. So who has been discovering the largest number of obscured AGNs? Who is discovering the most efficiently? And I'm going to say what I mean by that. And who is getting the most complete sample? OK, I'm going to start with what's close to my heart, the optical selection. So let's start with the low luminosity. And so, and I will take the example of the SDSS, but this has been done before. The idea is to select a complete sample of galaxies and then look for signs of nuclear activity in these galaxies and just do the census of uh, AGN in these complete samples of galaxies. So the biggest sample today is from Sloan, because there are a million galaxies. Um, so those papers were done at the time when there were 10 to the 5. And they selected, well, several thousand type 2 AGN from about 1,000 square degrees. And like I described before, the identification is based on emission lines. And so this is one of the standard so-called line diagnostic diagrams. This is O3 to H beta and to nitrogen 2 to H alpha line ratios. The idea is that star-forming galaxies lie here as a function of metallicity. Whereas um, if you have a photoionizing source that has a harder spectrum than an O or a B star, then objects go into this direction, basically. So you measure emission lines, cut this line here, and these sources are AGN. And I just want to emphasize that 
this procedure is very well de developed. These diagnostic diagrams are very well known. They've been studied theoretically, observationally for many years. And so at this point, the state of the art is such that if you measure line ratios and you say this is AGN or this is a star forming galaxy, everybody's going to believe you. And so this is not the case in the infrared and x-ray surveys because they have to confirm their sources with optical spectroscopy every time. And that's really the bottleneck for those surveys. So if you have an, a multi-fiber spectrograph that takes spectra of lots of sources, then there is no ambiguity in classification. And so at low redshift, they find that obscured objects dominate. Um, the, the specific measurement really varies even now, but it's, it's greater than, the ratio is greater than one. So we did um, our samples at high luminosity. This is the paper that uh, I'd like to advertise um, where Raina Reyes is the first author. So our objects are selected from a little bit of everything, not from, not from galaxies. And we go out to high redshift where galaxies are really uh, not that well resolved. So we have nine, 900 type 2 quasars selected from a million spectra. Again, identification is based on emission lines. We're very incomplete because Sloan does not have a good algorithm for selecting these objects for follow-up spectroscopy. There's very little hope for extending this to high redshift because these objects are really faint. So he, this I'm just showing here that uh, this is really our spectra of everything approach that allowed us to select such a large sample. Because you can see that these objects do not concentrate anywhere in the color color region. It's just basically really a little bit of everything. There's no trend with luminosity. There's no trend with redshift. They're just all over the place. Um, this is the stellar locus um, in black contours. This is the locus where normal quasars lie, so they're blue in all colors. And this is where our objects are, kind of like all over the place. So we take each spectrum, we redshift it by 0.01, we recalculate all colors, and we see whether it would still be selected by the Sloan targeting algorithm. And then we repeat this for all redshifts, and we calculate this way um, the so-called 1 over V max luminosity function. So we have a really complicated selection function because there are several targeting algorithms involved. And so here's our result. And I want you to concentrate, for example, on this highest luminosity point. So the black points are our measurement for type 2 quasars. The red points are for type 1 quasars. And I want you to concentrate on the highest luminosity points. And you will see that the our measurement is higher than, uh, than that for type 1 AGN. And so here we are very incomplete. So those are sources at high redshift, low luminosity. So we detect very few of those. Here the same story. And here, again, we detect more type 2 quasars than type 1. And here we become incomplete for a whole variety of other reasons. And I want to emphasize that our calculation is a lower limit. So all of these points are lower limits. And we think they're pretty strong lower limits, actually. OK, so in the x-rays, story, the story is very different in the x-rays. So now we're talking, I'm just going to take a specific example, Chandra Deep Field North. They have 600 sources, a lot of sources. Now they're talking about 0.12 square degrees, and we were talking about 6,000 square degrees. Um, so like I mentioned before, the bottleneck here is that every source requires optical spectroscopy. So in x-rays, you know, you detect x-rays, you know this is an AGN, but you, you don't know which redshift it's at. So you have, to, uh, you have to do optical spectroscopy. Some of these targets are very faint, and so it really just boils down to taking lots of spectra with 10 meter class telescopes. So they have found a few tens of obscured quasars at this point. So yes, they are discovering them in large numbers. It's very difficult to follow these targets, to follow up these targets. Uh, they have been claiming that the obscured fraction drops with luminosity. So here are a bunch of um, examples, compilations from different samples. So this is X-ray luminosity. This is the broad line fraction. So they're claiming it is increasing. And those are various references, all saying the same thing. It drops with luminosity. 
Um, in the infrared, there are a bunch of ongoing Spitzer surveys. So here's one example. This is a relatively shallow survey, four square degrees. Um, they have surveys going from you know, really small, sub-degree, deep fields to much larger ones. So in the infrared, the problem is that, so in the x-rays, every time you detect x-rays, you know it's an AGN. In the infrared, there is a confusion in, in that you don't know whether this object is, a, is an AGN or not. They're now developing pretty good infrared color selection uh, criteria. So here is an example. This is the 8.0, um, I think, versus 4.5 and 5.6 versus 3.6 .3, micron colors. So what happens is that star-forming galaxies have a strong feature, dust feature, at 8 microns. And so all these objects here with strong 8 microns are nearby star-forming galaxies. And this branch here, Parallel, uh, dominated objects, which they, th which they think are AGM. And so they, they put a color selection box here and take spectral of all of this and find that, yes, indeed, half of them are AGM or something like that. So um, they're going to have large numbers. It's going to be a very complete sample because all of this emission has to be radiated somewhere. So it's radiated thermally in the infrared. Um, unfortunately, these procedures are not well developed yet. So we're kind of hoping that uh, we will be able to improve on that with our sample. And they're not finding a decrease at high luminosities. Um, this is a preliminary. Uh, conclusion at this point, because they only have a handful of sources, but this is going to significantly improve with existing Spitzer data. Okay, and then there are a bunch of um, the population synthesis surveys in which they try to reproduce a whole number of observables, I don't know, distrib uh, distribution of redshifts, and uh, number counts at every wavelength, so th those are surveys that you probably have heard of, goods and cosmos and booties and um, all, all these other ones. So, okay. So, just to answer the three questions that I asked in the beginning. So, who has been discovering the largest number of obscured AGN? Optical surveys at low redshift, X-ray surveys at high redshift. I think that Spitzer surveys will find them all, but we don't know how yet. So, who is discovering them most efficiently? Efficiently in the sense that once you say this is obscured AGN, no follow-up is required. Optical surveys spectroscopic surveys, because this is the best, the best method of all at this point. So who is getting the most complete sample? Well, X-ray surveys, the harder you go, uh, the better it is, in the sense that it becomes sort of unbiased toward the type, but you could still be mis missing uh, extremely obscured objects. But I personally think that infrared surveys is the way to go, unless there are truly clean quasars that have no dust around them. What, what did you say? Radio, like NDSS, I thought the claim is that there are millions of... Uh, that's right. Well, there's a, exactly the same problem that the, you have to get uh, optical spectroscopy for each and every single one. Because from just looking in the radio, well, in the first place, in the first place, I think that uh, going from first to Sloan, for example, Sloan goes down to 20-second magnitude. But even with Sloan, only tens of percent of first sources have optical counterparts. So there are a bunch of you know, radio sources there that don't have optical counterparts down to the 20-second magnitude. So that's the first thing. The second thing, you look at the radio source. You don't know. I mean, some of them are clearly radio galaxies, but you don't know if this is an optically luminous, underluminous source. What's its bolometric output? What distance it's at? You know, radio. Unfortunately, for a given optical property, radio properties span several orders of magnitude in terms of flux output. So, radio does not really tell you much about the um, the um, output of the black hole in 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 the same way. So, yeah, this is. Our objects, many of our objects were found as a follow-up of faint radio, radio targets. That's true. But it's exactly the same problem as with the X-ray surveys. Mm -hmm. That's right, yeah. Um, 
That's true. So, yeah, this is certainly a way to go. Um, well, this is partly what Sloan has done, as a matter of fact, optical follow-up of faint, uh, faint radio sources. Um, so this is sort of included in, in our work, in, in a sense, yeah. Okay, so um, here are my conclusions. We selected 900 type 2 quasars from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. They show classical, uh, classical type 2 spectral energy distribution. They're red in the infrared. They have very high luminosities in the infrared. They are obscured in x-rays. So I wanted to emphasize that a different wavelength survey selects somewhat different samples. So X-ray obscured AGN is not exactly the same as an optically obscured AGN, not exactly the same as a, an obscured AGN selected from a, an infrared survey. Until a few years ago, only a few objects were known, but now this has turned around and now people are really interested in getting the census of these objects. They're expensive to identify, at least in X-ray and infrared surveys, and in the optical you have to have um, many, many spectra to get them. So I think that type 2 to type 1 ratio still remains, as a, st still remains a controversial measurement. Um, it's a function of redshift and luminosity, and so X-ray surveys say that it declines as a function of luminosity. Infrared surveys say that it doesn't. Uh, we find a ratio of at least 1.2, but probably much higher. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, why is it so small? Well, it's pretty big. It's 10 times more than all other samples of type 2 quasars combined. So, <laughs> but yeah, why it is small? Yes. No, but if you look yes, at yes. The yes. Right. So, um, okay, so if you look at the sample of main galaxies, then um, say roughly 1% will turn out to be low luminosity AG in, in Sloan, just from the numbers. Right, but then we're going, we're going, in terms of the luminosity function, we're going several orders of magnitude above that. So we are killing that, you know, by several orders of magnitude right there. If we are trying now to go out to a higher redshift to get a bigger volume than the main galaxy sample, then um, these objects are faint in the optical. The emission that you see in the continuum emission that you see in the optical is just the host galaxy plus a little bit of scattered light. So you take a null star galaxy, you put it at redshift of 0 0.6, right? So Sloan would. Well, we have in terms of the O3 line emission, yes. It's not a very restrictive threshold. What our selection is really limited by is, um, well, Sloan spectroscopic survey doesn't go that deep. So it's 20 point, what, depending on the specific algorithm, you know, no more than, no deeper than 21st magnitude. So it really kills us that these objects are so faint in the optical. And um, emission yeah, lines, yeah. Sorry, I thought you were going to say that it was because we didn't use peak liners. No, well, liners, right. Okay, so um, so liners, you, you're talking about objects in this part of the diagram. Well, you could actually say that, yes. Um, I'm not sure that, okay, so once we go out to redshifts above 0.3, uh, we, our selection is based on the O3 to H beta ratio, so it has to be higher than some threshold. Uh, that would be roughly here. Okay, so that might actually exclude liners right there. And the problem is that if we, go, if we go here, then we would get a lot of contamination from star-forming galaxies. And at that point, we're also using Nian 5 line to distinguish um, AGN from star-forming galaxies. So we might be excluding liners by that criterion, yes. But I don't think I have seen, I mean, this, this didn't just fall on us, you know, from the sky. We developed this criterion after looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of spectra. And I've got to say that I didn't really see any strong Nian 5 emitters that have line ratio in this, in this region. So for us, 
For us, we really require the presence of a hard ionizing continuum, basically. Yeah, I haven't thought about liners in a long time. 